Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on endometriosis and pain. Uh, my name is Melinda, and I'm from the European Pain Federation, EFIC. And I'm joined here by three speakers uh, that are, who are, will introduce themselves briefly in a second. But first, I just wanted to give you a bit of context. So um, in case you're not familiar with the European Pain Federation, we're a multidisciplinary um, professional organization in the field of pain research and medicine. We're made up of 38 European chapters of the International Association for the Study of Pain, so IASP. So we represent close to 20,000 physicians, basic researchers, nurses, physiotherapists, as I said, multidisciplinary psychologists um, and healthcare professionals across Europe with an interest in pain. And um, uh, one of our main activities and projects is actually coming up later this year. It's the uh, next EFIC Congress taking place in Budapest in September. Um, the theme for this one is personalized pain management. The future is now. So if you're interested, please have a look at our website. We'd love to see you and welcome you. Uh, as we know, there were quite a few years where we weren't able to meet in person. So it'll be nice to see everyone and um, have the European pain community meet again. Now for our webinar today, um, we have three presentations um, from uh, Katie Vincent, uh, Marcelo de Franza, and Claudia Cesari. So I'll briefly let them introduce themselves. Katie, why don't you go first? Hi, um, I'm Katie Vincent. I'm an academic gynecologist um, in Oxford and I run pelvic pain and endometriosis associated pain clinics there, um, as well as researching into pain mechanisms in endometriosis. And how about you, Marcelo? <clears throat> I'm Marcelo de França Moreira from Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. I'm a physiotherapist and I work as my research project is about mindfulness meditation for chronic pain, um, mainly for women with endometriosis. And I, I work also in clinical practice with, as a physiotherapist, integrating uh, mindfulness based intervention, and I also a uh, yoga instructor. Thank you so much. And now you, Claudia. Hi, everyone. I'm Claudia, and I'm a researcher at King's College London. Uh, my research is um, focuses on biopsychosocial approaches to pain, particularly pelvic pain, so endometriosis and vulvodynia. And I'm also the founder of FemSpace, uh, the first digital care platform for anyone who lives with chronic pelvic pain. Thank you all for joining. So before we get started uh, with Katie's presentation, just wanted to point out briefly that obviously we're happy to have any questions from you. There's a questions module um, usually at the bottom of your screen and we'll save all the questions for at the end after the three presentations have been held. So feel free to drop your questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. But now I give over to you, Katie. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Melinda. I'm just going to see if I can share my screen. Can you see my presentation in slide view? We yeah. can. Perfect. So I'm going to talk to you about why people with endometriosis experience pain. So I'll give a brief overview of the clinical problem for those of you not familiar with the, um, these types of cases, then have a think about what we know about what causes and maintains pain in association with endometriosis, and then just briefly reflect on what this might mean for our current treatment strategies. So what is the clinical problem of endometriosis? Well, endometriosis, as I'm sure you all know, is a, a chronic inflammatory condition, and it's characterized by the presence of tissue that resembles the endometrium, so the lining of the uterus, but outside of the uterus. It's really common. About one in 10 reproductive age women are thought to have the condition, but we don't know whether that's a really an accurate estimate, given that at the moment we don't have a non-invasive diagnostic test. So in the UK alone, that's about 1.5 million women, and it has a really substantial financial cost. Again, in the UK, it costs about £8.2 billion per year, and you can imagine how much that's amplified if we look across Europe as a whole. And the clinical pre presentation is really variable and also very non-specific. So you can see that in this study from quite a long time ago, um, the symptoms that led to diagnosis were predominantly pain symptoms, so period pain, dysmenorrhea, non-cyclical pelvic pain, pain with sex, dyspareunia, but also bowel pain and pain with passing urine, 
but also other symptoms like infertility, um, the identification of an ovarian mass, for example, but also there's a significant proportion of patients who don't have any pain symptoms at all. And this is one of the particular challenges of the condition is that our findings at surgery really don't relate to our symptoms. So our standard classification is the ASRM staging, and this ranges from one to four, as you can see through these four panels here. And so the more disease, the deeper it's infiltrated, the larger the cysts on the ovary, for example, the greater your staging will be. But the staging was really based as a, um, a fertility predictor. And what we know is actually there's very little relationship between the symptoms and the presence of disease at all. So trying to decide who out of a batch of people with pelvic pain might have endometriosis, we really can't do from um, history alone. There's also no relation between symptoms and site of disease and no correlation between the stage of disease and symptom severity. And I think this really contributes to how challenging it can feel for patients and not feeling like their symptoms are taken seriously if they only have mild disease, for example. And what are our current recommended treatments? So for those with endometriosis and pain who are not trying to get pregnant at the moment, our first line recommendations are hormonal therapies and our second line recommendations are, are, are surgery, either conservative or definitive. Um, but of course, we know that there's a huge diagnostic delay. I've already mentioned we don't have a non-invasive test. And so women have usually had symptoms for sort of seven to 11 years across the Western world before they get a diagnosis. So I would argue that they already have a chronic pain condition by the time we diagnose them with endometriosis. We know that only about 50% of them will be completely pain-free if we start them on hormones and hormones have a huge batch of side effects. And it's very much a case of trial and error to find one that might suit. And if we actually think about surgery, there's actually very limited evidence of benefit. Our surgical trials are relatively poorly designed and much of this has just been standard practice for a long time without anyone actually really undertaking um, good surgical trials. And there are some surgical trials running at the moment, but they've been quite provocative. Uh, many people have been quite upset that we thought that we need to actually start to do these at this stage. And how do we classify endometriosis? Well, uh, endometriosis falls within the new ICD-11 um, as a chronic secondary visceral pain. So I've already said that we think it's chronic. And if we think about the underlying mechanisms, we, I've highlighted it here as a being a visceral pain from persistent inflammation. And traditionally, we think of it as a nociceptive condition. So on the background of that, what do we think actually causes and maintains pain in association with this condition? Well, this is really our traditional model of endometriosis associated pain. We know that endometriosis causes inflammation. It can compress structures or nerves within the pelvis and it's associated with fibrosis. And so together um, we've traditionally thought of these as our pain generators and that's where our, our treatments are targeted at non-steroidal inflammatories, hormones to suppress disease or surgery to excise disease. And what we know now is that the pathogenesis is really very complex and that there's a large amount of inflam inflammation within the peritoneal fluid, within the peritoneum nearby and within the pelvic organs. But actually, though this hasn't been studied in as much detail as it probably needs to be, these inflammatory mediators really only seem to relate to the presence or the intensity of dysmenorrhea, so period pain, and not to the other pains. But we do know that endometriotic deposits themselves are both vascularized, allowing them to continue, um, but also innervated. And so the idea that you have newly innervated lesions within the pelvis, within a very inflammatory medium, would of course be the perfect way of generating sensitization, at least in the periphery. So do we have any evidence that peripheral sensitization occurs? And in fact, we do. We have increasing evidence as more and more people become interested in this. The body um, of support for this idea has really increased over recent years. Um, we showed in a relatively large patient um, support group survey with about 1400 women that actually about 40 percent of them would be categorized as having a neuropathic component to their pain when we use the pain detect scale. 
And 14% of those actually describe numbness, so sort of a true neuropathic um, feature rather than just potentially a sign of um, ampli amplification of signals. And if we um, do some sort of more detailed QST type um, assessments, we can see that um, women with endometriosis, so that's those labelled on the um, bar chart as EAP or EABP, have all the different types of pathological um, sensory profiles that are seen in neuropathic pain. Predominantly, we're seeing a mechanical hyperalgesia, but we are seeing sensory loss and thermal hyperalgesia as well. And uh, other groups have demonstrated small fiber neuropathy in skin biopsies from the um, low pelvic abdominal um, skin in women with endometriosis associated pain as well. We also can see quite significant evidence of changes in the central nervous system. The fact that we get widespread sensitivity to noxious stimuli, not just on the abdomen, but on the hand, on the back, or from inflation of a blood pressure cuff, for example. And that in the brain, we're seeing um, altered levels of excitatory neurotransmitters in those with endometriosis and pelvic pain. Interestingly, those with endometriosis, but without pelvic pain, don't have um, the same level of increases. So there seems to be something specific to those with pain and endometriosis. And we're also aware that the brain volume of women with endometriosis and pelvic pain is decreased similarly um, to how we've seen in plenty of other chronic pain conditions. So really thinking that actually endometriosis associated pain is really very parallel to the other pain conditions that have been well explored. We also know that the pelvic organs sit very close to one another within the pelvis and share um, relatively complex innovation patterns. So visceral-visceral referral um, is very likely to occur and there's again increasing data suggesting that this is the case. And so we see um, a high rate of comorbidity of pelvic pain conditions. So many women with endometriosis associated pain also have bladder pain syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, um, vulval pain conditions, for example. And we're increasingly aware of the role of the musculoskeletal system in chronic pelvic pain. It's been quite classically considered in things like low back pain, but actually to think about the bulk of muscle that exists in the pelvis, the abdominal wall, the low back, but also the pelvic floor. And so um, people have prior to this not really um, looked at this in detail, but there's some very good evidence, particularly coming out of Pam Stratton's work at NIH, showing um, the prevalence of musculoskeletal factors in association with endometriosis. But we also know that people with endometriosis describe pain outside of their pelvis. And again, if you look on this bar chart, um, the pink and the yellow bars are those um, women with endometriosis. And we can see that over half of them describe their pain just being in their pelvis. But then we also see that they describe pain in one or two regions outside of their pelvis or widespread across their body. It's in fact incredibly common. And a recent genetics paper um, shows the overlap in genetic vulnerabilities, both to endometriosis, but also to other chronic conditions. And these um, turquoise bar here are all pain symptoms or pain conditions. And we can see that there's real genetic overlap in the um, vulnerability to developing these, suggesting that there may be common mechanisms underlying multiple different types of chronic pain conditions. So I'd like to propose that actually our possible pain mechanisms in endometriosis are far more complex um, than we might have originally thought. And I obviously haven't had time to sort of go through all of these in detail this morning. So what does that mean for our treatment strategies? Well, I think that we can argue that suppressing our lesions with hormones or excising them potentially will re reduce the inflammation, might reduce the amount of nerve growth factor and vascular growth factor circulating, and we can alter any of the hormone factors that might increase inflammation potentially. But our surgery is in itself traumatic. It damages peripheral nerve fibers, um, both on the abdominal wall as we cut through, but also as we burn or excise um, lesions within this inflammatory pelvis. And we also put women in relatively uncomfortable positions with their legs up in stirrups for quite a long time during surgery. And that may actually have an impact, particularly on the pelvic floor and the low back muscles. I don't think we know what um, impact our treatments have on some of these more central mechanisms, sort of widespread systemic inflammation, or actually 
the disappointment or relief of your surgical findings and what that might do to your mental health, for example. But I do think having an understanding of our pain mechanisms might be able to help us rationalize our surgery. So I've already talked about the fact that many women have widespread pain. Um, this is work from Susie Asani's group in Michigan that showed that if you take a centralized pain inventory, every one point increase in that score before a hysterectomy for pelvic pain was associated with an over 25% increase in the odds of developing persistent pelvic pain six months after surgery. So actually, maybe we shouldn't be thinking about doing hysterectomies as first line treatment for those with widespread pain. And this was data, again, from our questionnaire survey, which showed that the rates of neuropathic pain were much greater in those who'd had repeated surgeries. Now, obviously, we can't say from a cross-sectional study that surgery itself causes neuropathic pain. It may be that those with a neuropathic component to their pain don't respond to surgical treatment and therefore keep on representing and that our default is to offer them a further surgical procedure. But I think, again, it makes us think maybe we should stop and think um, before we do another surgery. And I wonder whether we actually should consider classifying endometriosis-associated pain differently. It certainly is a chronic secondary visceral pain, but it's also a post-surgical or post-traumatic pain. It has a neuropathic component in some women, and it definitely has a musculoskeletal component for some women. So actually, it's much more complex. And I guess the point of this is only to help us think a little bit more broadly about what our treatments are. So I'd like to propose that maybe we should consider a pain-focused approach to endometriosis much earlier in the patient journey. Currently, it's very much our end stage option once all our standard approaches ha have been completed. And I think um, I'm really excited to hear the presentations that are coming from our next two speakers because they take very much that much more broader holistic approach to the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. That was a great start. Um, I would now like to hand over to Marcelo for the second presentation. Share my screen, just a minute. So I'm pleased to share our research project with the European Pen Federation community. Thanks for the invitation. And congratulations for their initiative to organize this event. Thank you, Professor Katie for the great exposition regarding the metastasis pain. I will talk about part of my research project that is regarding the benefit of integrated mindfulness-based intervention in standard medical care for women with endometriosis, a project <clears throat> with uh, no fault and no conflict of interest. And just a brief reminder of some clinical aspects. Endometriosis is in fact a uh, heterogeneous disease with three well recognized phenotypes or the, the superficial uh, peritoneal lesion. Uh, ovarian endometriomas and the deep infiltrating endometriosis. Uh, the more severe endometriosis phenotype, the, the possibility of cause organ stenosis. So deep endometriosis can affect the rectovaginal region, bowel, ureters, and bladder. Um, cyclic bleeding in response to amplified estrogen influence will occur in the endometrial lesion, leading to an immune response and heightened inflammatory milieu which is followed, just as uh, Professor Katie said, by a peripheral and possibly a central sensitization of nociceptive pathway, which makes women uh, vulnerable to pain and infer infertility that are the main symptoms. 
it is uh, accepted that the endometriosis lesions trigger the cascade of alteration that produce the condition symptoms and consequently open the path to a broad compromising quality of life and the woman's well-being. But we know that the pain, which has a protective function, is not just determined by nociceptive activity. So pain is modulated by a multi-level or multi-domain evidence of danger or safety. Uh, you, uh, we can understand pain uh, from, from this perspective. And that judgment depends, the, the judgment, what is uh, danger or safety or safe. It depends on interpretation shaped by context, past experience and knowledge and belief. So in accordance with this perspective, preliminary evidence suggests that the role of psychosocial factors in modulating endometriosis pain, as in other chronic pain conditions. And for example, um, pain catastrophizing, the tendency to magnify straight value of pain associated with the inability of inhibit uh, pain-related thoughts and feelings of helplessness. Uh, pain catastrophizing at baseline predicts endometriosis pain severity after one year of follow-up. And qualitative studies have shown that women with endometriosis often employ other maladaptive coping strategies like rumination, worry, and anxiety about pain recurrence. And uh, at the social level, lay people and many health professionals are usually unaware of endometriosis as possible severe condition, which leads to a normalization and disbelief of women's symptoms. And the consequent lack of social support and increased uh, feelings of helplessness. So all these factors, including endometriosis induced nociceptive activity, uh, can increase the evidence of danger and consequently increase pain. Uh, similarly, other factors, uh, like um, other factors can increase the evidence of safety, like hypoestrogenic and anti-inflammatory state, adaptive copy strategy, family and marital support, and positive effects. So we can understand endometriosis pain as an output that emerged uh, from the contribution of inputs from different biopsychosocial levels. And each woman, although with the same condition, will have your own mosaic of factors influence your symptoms. Thus, it is expected uh, that patients in which the biological level has a major uh, symptoms contribution, for example, high peripheral nociceptive sensitization, I will respond better to surgery or medication that target this level, but probably not those in which the, uh, no, no, uh, not those in which the, uh, cognitive affected level uh, plays a major role in the evidence of danger. Or maybe it's one of the reasons why the significant proportion of patients do not respond to endometriosis under medical care, that is uh, surgery and hormonal treatment. For example, when surgical treatment is compared with diagnostic surgery, a proportional between 30% and 40% of women report pain related only. Regarding the response to hormonal therapy, that is the medication that suppress the local or systemic estrogen level between 11 and 19 has no reduction in pain, while at the end of the treatment, 5% uh, and 59% have pain remaining. So this result suggests that treatment that targets the peripheral nociceptive source of endometriosis pain can be unsatisfactory in many cases. Unfortunately, it's not, uh, it's not, it has not moved the, the field to investigate other treatment options and non-pharmacological conservative treatment remain understood yet so far. So a brief uh, PubMed research illustrates this scenario. So as, I, as you can see, most randomized controlled trial uh, investigates surgical and pharmacological treatment with just few exceptions and none of it investigated the mechanism of outcome change. So unfortunately, clinicians are left with very few evidence-based therapeutic options in the endometriosis uh, context, which is uh, the reason that motivates uh, our research project.
So we decided to investigate a psychosocial approach, mindfulness-based intervention. So the main component is meditation training. So the mindfulness field developed a robust evidence about the benefits of the intervention in many clinical conditions including um, those chronic pain conditions, but it was, uh, it was never studied in the endometriosis context. So the reasoning behind the possible benefits of mindfulness in the endometriosis context is the ability of, this, of such intervention to change a set of maladaptive coping, uh, like it can catastrophizing negative effects, and as we know by a large body of evidence, these factors negatively impact pain, stress perception, and uh, quite a lot of life. So there is also the possibility of benefit to the development of positive qualities, for example, acceptance, tranquility, uh, relaxation, that may improve well-being independently of pain change. So there are different mindfulness-based uh, interventions uh, that were developed to meet these needs and proposed. For example, uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for depression relapse, and the first intervention on mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, elaborated to help deal with various challenges, including chronic pain. So we based on the mindfulness-based stress reduction to tailor our intervention to women with endometriosis. Uh, all mindfulness-based intervention have three, have three components, uh, meditation training, inquiry, and psychoeducation. So uh, during the meditation, um, participants are, are taught to establish an intention of stay aware and regulate attention on the flux of body sensation. They are structured, structured to note when distraction arrives, uh, when distraction are fought, observe fought as fought, and perceive sensations, whether pleasant or unpleasant, without an effort to change them. Or when, when attention becomes uh, fixed on distraction, they are instructed to let go of it repetitively with patience and tranquility. Uh, that is the, the relationship with the experience, participants are guided to cultivate a set of attitudes like no elaborate about the experience or no incentivate self-talking, or cultivate acceptance towards the ex external and internal experience, not applying high effort during the meditation. Instead, keep a clear intention to stay in the present and not monitor uh, results. Another intervention component is the inquiry which is the process of being aware and sharing what was experiencing done to, uh, during, during meditation. And psychoeducation, which in our program, specifically in our, in our program, was adapted from integration of mindfulness intervention, contemporary pen science, and psychophysiology. So the main, uh, the main thing, the main, the main psychoeducation thing approached by our intervention was reconceptualizing pain modulation from tissue damage to general risk perception, mindfulness attitudes, stress response, the interaction between thoughts, emotion, body sensation, and the role in stress, uh, stress pain, and well being. So, our first research question was if mindfulness can improve pain, that was our primary outcome. Uh, psychological stress and quality of life. In women with deep endometriosis, group remains symptomatic despite undergoing hormonal and analgesic treatment. That is the standard medical care. So we uh, randomized women with moderate to severe intense pain into two groups, uh, standard medical care versus stand standard medical care plus mindfulness-based intervention. Uh, the variables of interest were measured during baseline after four and eight weeks using the pain American scale for each endometriosis uh, pain characteristic. And perceived stress and quality of life were measured using perceived stress scale and SF36. So during the first four weeks, participants in the mindfulness group had on-site group classes once a week for one hour and 30 minutes. 
Um, participants were encouraged to reproduce the, gui the, the guided meditation exercise daily at home. Uh, with the support of an audio record, this meditation exercise ranged from 20 to 30 minutes. They were also stimulated to cultivate mindfulness attitudes uh, during daily activities, what we call uh, informal mindfulness um, practice. Uh, from week four to eight, participants were encouraged to maintain meditation and informal practice with the support of weekly online instruction. So we found that mindfulness group immediately uh, post treatment had a significant reduction in self pain of medium effect size and a number need to treat of five, which means that we need to treat five patients to one gain in minimally, minimally important change in pain. That is the reduction greater than one point in the numeric pain scale. And a similar improvement in this case. And as we see, a more pronounced reduction occurred in pain unpleasant, um, pain unpleasantness with a large effect size and a number needs to treat of three. Uh, after follow up, all the endometriosis related pain subside. However, in terms of proportion of patients that achieved the minimally important change, the mindfulness group was worse in this pioneer which is expressed by a negative number need to treat, minus nine here. And this minoria in which this infinite symbol means that both groups had the same proportion of patients achieving the minimally important change. So uh, the significant effect in favor of mindfulness group in these variables uh, means that although fewer patients achieved the minimally important change, they had a greater magnitude of change that produce the difference on average. So regarding the perceived stress and part of life, immediately post intervention, there was a significant reduction in perceived stress, but only in the analysis of two outliers, one of each group, which means that on average, mindfulness can improve uh, stress. However, uh, there are maybe patients who essentially do not respond to the intervention in terms of stress reduction. Of all parts of life domains, uh, mindfulness improved the mental health, causing a large effect size and a number need to treat three. And after follow up, um, the positive change in mental health remained. And mindfulness also improved the vitality, inducing a medium effect size and a number need to treat of two. So these chains are very important given the evidence of higher level of psychological stress, fatigue, and mental health deterioration in this um, population. So some reflections about the findings. Um, mindfulness meditation develops a present centered awareness that approach all sensations with an attitude of acceptance without the effort to change them. But therefore it is expected, just as in other studies, to have a greater impact on the affective dimension than sensory pain dimension, as demonstrated in our study by a more robust change in pain unpleasantness. So the overall effect on pain did not translate into an extensive impact on uh, quality of life domains, like um, uh, social and physical domains. So perhaps beliefs regarding physical and social uh, functioning are not immediately reformulated after the pain subsides and may require more extensive or directed, uh, directed intervention such as pair-based meditation or an exposition to physical exercise to impact uh, also those culture of life domains. So women in our study were, uh, uh, women in our study, our study are symptomatic even under hormonal treatment that mainly reduce peripheral uh, non-sensitive sources. So it implies that those who benefit from uh, the mindfulness training are responded to a particular top-down path for intervention process. Uh, for example, outcome change may occur as a consequence of improved attentional flexibility, inhibitory control and acceptance attitude that may allow women 
to develop more adaptive popping strategy. So um, this mindfulness-based intervention adaptation can benefit women with endometriosis who do not respond to hormonal treatment alone. Or it is worth highlighting that such a benefit occurred in uh, endometriosis patients that aside from the condition, living in a vulnerable context. Um, vulnerable because women of our sample have low income, often live in a violent environment, and they are in substandard housing. So consequently, they are exposed to a wide variety of stressors that probably uh, interact, interact with those related to endometriosis. So the study has uh, limitations, obviously, that we can check uh, in the paper. <laughs> Uh, that can challenge the certainty of some findings, but we can consider the improvement in pain and pleasantness and mental health and vitality uh, quite robust, robust findings uh, that proceed justify the use of mindfulness in the endometriosis context, in my opinion. So other projects uh, approached other research questions. Uh, related to the intervention mechanism and self-regulation. Uh, we don't have, uh, have time to, uh, to share it uh, now, but I expect to meet the Pain Federation community again to share these other findings. Uh, and this, uh, this project was carried out with my mentor, Professor Marco Aurelio Pinho and Professor Olga Lucia Gamboa. Uh, my thanks to both. Uh, I don't have a visual social network, so if you want to contact me, you can do by email. I hope the lecture was helpful for some of you. Thanks for the attention. Thank you so much, Marcelo. I also just shared the link to uh, the direct the direct link to the paper in the chat. So if anyone wants to have a look at that, you can check it out in more detail. And I now would like to hand over to Claudia for our final presentation. Thank you so much. So let me see if I'm sharing screens. Okay, is this, but let me put it to present. How do I? Oh, done. Okay, is this, can you see the screen? We can. Okay, is it doing the presenter view or is it doing full screen? It's, it's a presenter view, so we can see the, oh. next, uh, the next slide as well. Try oh. to exit and then. Oh, there you go. Yes, there Fine. you go. Looks oh. great. Get rid of that. Somehow, somehow. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, how do I? Okay, this will do for now. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you for the invite in speaking about uh, endometriosis and the multitude of factors that um, that um, occur when it comes to living with a long-term condition. My research specifically yeah. looks at, a re, um, at understanding the role of physical symptoms and also psychological factors in the management of endometriosis um, and in general with other types of pelvic pain such as vulvodynia. This is how I, this is what I did for my PhD at King's College London. My PhD was specifically focused on understanding psychological and social factors in the context of vulvodynia and also developing treatments based on these psychosocial factors um, that are specific to vulvodynia. And we've opened our research focus to different types of uh, pelvic pain conditions, such as endometriosis. So we know that one in 10 people live with endometriosis. And um, obviously we know that the estimates are not accurate. There's a lot of issues with diagnostics. So it could be that more women and people assigned female at birth live with this condition. The most important thing to remember when it comes to, sorry, having some tech issues today, uh, when it comes to endometriosis is that it's not just about the pain. We know that of course there is chronic pain or persistent pain when it comes to endometriosis, but there's also a multitude of other symptoms um, that are psychological and that feed into the pain pathways. And this can be anxiety, depression, stigma, catastrophizing, body image, but I put them in question marks because actually we don't really have a good conceptualization of what specific factors are relevant in endometriosis. 
And this is because of the lack of research when it comes to women's health, when it comes to pelvic pain in particular, and this is reflected um, in endometriosis. So it, while we do have an expectation that there are psychological and social factors involved, we don't know specifically what these are. And this is particularly relevant because when it comes to building specific um, psychological or psychosocial interventions, we need to understand the complexity and the specificity of endometriosis. And when we do so by understanding what specific psychosocial factors are involved, then we can develop more specific treatments and more effective treatments. And when it comes to psychological and social factors in endometriosis, it's also, it's also very dualistic. It's either, you know, these factors are the cause of the pain. So psychological factors are the cause or it's slowly only focused on physical symptoms. And so it's important to have an integrated approach, both when it comes to medical treatments of endometriosis, but also psychological treatments that acknowledges the, of course, the severity of physical symptoms, but also the importance of psychological symptoms. And so this is what we did. Um, this is one of the papers that we uh, worked on and it's a systematic review that basically was the foundation to understand the role of psychosocial factors in endometriosis. And we focused on two outcomes, pain, so pain severity or pain intensity, and health-related uh, quality of life. So our aim was to identify and systematically review the role of psychological and social factors associated with the, these two key outcomes, pain severity and health-related quality of life in women uh, who live with endometriosis. Our inclusion criteria are people who are 16 or older and who lived with a confirmed diagnosis of endometriosis. And we focused on, um, we focused on studies that looked at the association, so through correlations or regressions between psychological factors and, um, and social factors with, uh, with, uh, with the outcomes of pain and health-related quality of life specifically. So what did we find? Um, we found that we had 27 studies uh, of people with endometriosis. Most of them had medium quality and five of them had low quality. Um, we found a variety of, of factors. Most of them were only research ones. So we can't really claim anything when it comes to um, finding associations and of course no causality, but there's, there were some factors that were researched more than once and these were depression, anxiety and catastrophizing. This is probably because of the, of the general literature that usually looks at this in other pain conditions and so it's more likely that this was already looked at in endometriosis and we found that anxiety, depression and catastrophizing were significantly associated with both pain and health related quality of life in endometriosis. We also had, again, other factors, but these were only research ones and therefore weren't you know, included in the interpretation of these findings. So this is a preliminary summary of our data. We, um, as you can see here, when it comes to pelvic pain and health related quality of life, we have catastrophizing, depression and anxiety. So the green, the green um, arrows represent positive association. So more depression, more pain here, more depression, more catastrophizing. And the red are negative associations. When you see two arrows here is because there is a bidirectional association. So anxiety with pain and pain with anxiety. And when it comes to the dotted lines, so for example, anxiety and depression, or and depression and anxiety, these are dotted because there, this wasn't did, did, didn't stem from the data. These are hypothetical associations that we know that are probably there. So anxiety being related to depression and depression being associated with anxiety. Same goes with catastrophizing and depression with catastrophizing. But this is all to say that we know now that psychological and social factors actually are associated with physical symptoms. And this is very important when it comes to uh, developing specific interventions. Now, this was great, but it wasn't widely available. And the reason I'm saying this is because when it, it, when it comes to research, it's very important, of course, to, to have the foundations to develop psychosocial treatments, but also I realized that the average, the average journey of a person with endometriosis, the average journey of a person with chronic pain is many years of diagnostic delay. And when it comes to ser services, it's either, um, it's either very medical or very psychological. Again, there's no conceptualization that acknowledges both and it's not widely available. 
Um, most people don't get diagnosed. When they get diagnosed, they're either offer, offer, offered sorry, uh, medical treatments or psychological treatments. And this is something that um, I've, I've seen through the research for many years. And when it, when it came to asking people what they needed, when it came to their pelvic pain care, what they mostly talked about was the lack of um, psychological support for their condition because these conditions last for many years and also the lack of physiotherapy for the pelvic floor again, like Katie was suggesting as well, and Marcelo were suggesting, these are really important when it comes to pelvic pain, but they're not widely available. And many people are told that pelvic pain, um, endometriosis, sorry, in endometriosis or vulvodynia, pelvic pain um, physiotherapy, pelvic floor, sorry, physiotherapy is not relevant for them. And therefore they don't really look at this option. And because of the lack of accessibility in healthcare, this is what led to, um, to the major economic impact of these conditions. When we look at endometriosis, these are the yearly direct and indirect costs. When it comes to vulvodynia, we have an annual US economic burden of 31 to $72 billion. And we also know that um, this lack of long-term care has major uh, repercussions, not only that are economic, of course, but also uh, physical and also psychological for people. And this is what led to implementing this research and feeding all the research in endometriosis and vulvodynia into FemSpace. And Fem FemSpace is all about making pelvic pain care accessible to everyone and for this to be driven by science. This is a collaborative project and that um, has a mission to provide a new standard of care in pelvic pain and for this to be digital so that as many people as possible can access care in pelvic pain and for this to be driven by science. Our solution is that we're providing digital care for pelvic pain, and this is led by experts in pain management, physiotherapy, and sex therapy. Another aspect that doesn't really get much airtime in endometriosis and other types of pelvic, pelvic pain is the sexual outcomes, the sexual repercussions. And we don't want that to not be acknowledged. And in view of uh, the biopsychosocial model, we want to provide all of that, the psychology aspect, the physiotherapy aspect, and the sex aspect. And so this is what we provide. We provide psychotherapy for pelvic pain that includes sex therapy and also women's health physiotherapy for pelvic pain and for this to be digital and accessible. This is a collaborative project that started at King's College London. So we'll always be, we're supported by King's and we'll always have research in tandem um, with implementation and implementation that feeds more research. And so we're, we are very lucky to be supported by amazing partners and amazing advisors like Professor Ronamos Morris at King's College London. And, and that would be the end of it. We, we believe that everyone deserves a safe space to find accessible and expert support for pelvic pain. Um, so if you're interested in learning more and interested in what, the, what research we'll, we'll be doing next month at King's, of course, uh, you can get in touch with me by visiting our website or getting in touch with me by, uh, by email. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Claudia, and also to Marcelo and Katie for your presentations today. Um, I believe we have about uh, roughly 10 minutes left for questions. So I see a couple already um, and we'll go through them. If you have any other questions, please pose them now so we can get to them. And of course, if any of the speakers have any questions of the other presentations, <laughs> just go ahead. But we'll get started with a question by Karen, who asked whether um, we can expand on uh, musculoskeletal uh, pain causes and how to identify and treat them. Anyone would like to start on that particular question? Katie, maybe. Yeah, I'm very happy to expand on that, but Claudia clearly has some experience as well, so might want to add um, when I've finished. Um, so I think the musculoskeletal components are, are quite complex, and I think I'd like to sort of divide it into two, really. I think there are those that are associated with having the endometriosis, and there are those that might have been there already and caused the pain that led to the endometriosis being found. And I think sometimes the second ones are probably more complex for people to get their heads around. Um, I think we all know that if you're in pain, if you've got ongoing symptoms, you're likely to change your behaviours, your posture, that kind of thing. So, you know, if you've got pain on your side and you lean forwards to protect that area, you'll shorten those muscles of your abdominal wall and stretch the muscles of your lower back. And if that continues for days and days and weeks and months, then you're gonna end up with a shortening and a, a strain on specific muscles. 
Um, probably there's also something about just having inflammation there within the pelvis that's altering how the muscles function in a somatic viscero referral type pattern. Um, and also repeated um, bowel emptying with diarrhea and that kind of thing, or repeated episodes of UTIs will probably also alter the pelvic floor. So those are all reasons why endometriosis itself might generate pain. But we also see that people who have hip dysplasia, for example, might have actually slight um, malalignments in the way their pelvis functions and their pelvic floor and their lower back maybe just take a bit more strain. And over time that can end up generating pain in itself. Or um, anyone who's had an accident ended up on crutches, maybe changes their gait for a while. And again, all these things sort of add up. I predominantly see younger women in my um, teenage pelvic pain clinic. We see a lot of girls that were elite gymnasts, ballet dancers, and then suddenly gave up very quickly. And maybe that's altered how their pelvic floors um, respond. We also know that if you've had traumatic experiences, you're going to have a, a subconscious response to things like sex that will lead to your pelvic floor becoming tight subconsciously, but then that you can get into a vicious circle of expecting that to be sore and you get muscle contraction before anything has even started. And then that can build into a cycle as well. So I, I'm sure a physiotherapist would have explained those relationships much better than me, but I think there's multiple different ways that musculoskeletal components can be generated I think sometimes the tricky thing is to explain to people that, yes, we know you've got lesions of endometriosis within your pelvis, and we know you've had one surgery that gave you benefit for three to six months, for example, but actually we found a whole load of musculoskeletal reasons why you've now got pain, and that our recommendation is that you engage with a course of physiotherapy that's quite hard work. It's not us doing something to you, it's us suggesting what you do yourself You've got to practice it at home. You've got to attend the group classes or attend your one-to-one -one sessions. And it's going to take time to persuade people of that rather than having another operation, particularly when you know there's so much more interest in the media about endometriosis, which is fantastic. It's really raising awareness, but it is still focusing much more on the treatment of the endometriosis lesions rather than the wider picture. Claudia or Marcel, would you like to add anything on that? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, as Katie said, absolutely. The pelvic floor has a huge impact when it comes to, I guess, um, the long-term effects of endometriosis. And also there's the issue of comorbidity that we've all talked about. And we know that in vulvodynia, for example, and endometriosis and vulvar pain have a lot of comorbidities and that's where you know the pelvic floor can really help. Um, particularly when it comes to vulvodynia, we know that there's no enough evidence to recommend any neuromodulators or any of the treatments that are currently recommended, but there's preliminary evidence that the pelvic floor is involved and can be helped with pelvic floor physiotherapy. And considering the involvement of all these, um, of all these conditions in endometriosis, which again, vulvodynia is one of them, um, it's really highly likely that pelvic floor physio can really help with this. And there's also, of course, the, you know, vaginismus that's often, you know, accompanied by the endometriosis. And again, that has a pelvic floor component that can, can be addressed. And yeah, bowel function as well, sexual function. So I think pelvic floor physio has a, a huge impact when it comes to acti returning to activity levels and, bowel problems, urinary problems, uh, as well as sexual, sexual outcomes when it comes to endometriosis, yeah. So another question that we received um, was uh, about the, uh, the early recognition and early intervention. So someone asked, can you mention important uh, cardinal steps of the diagnostic process? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly take that one if you like. I mean, I, I guess I should put my hand up and say here that obviously diagnostic delay in endometriosis is really important, but I worry much more about treatment delay. And I think that we can start with treatment even if we don't have a diagnosis yet. So we can use analgesics, we can use hormone therapies, or all of those are relevant for pelvic pain, whether or not there's an underlying pathology. So to just leave people continuously dismissed because we haven't got an underlying diagnosis, that's in, in my view more important than fast tracking the diagnosis. 
which doesn't mean that I don't think diagnosis is important, but I, I just want to emphasize that I think the pain is the, the real issue here. Um, the diagnostic pathway, it involves people being aware of what the symptoms are. You know, if you think that period pain is normal, if your mum had period pain, your grandma had period pain, and everyone tells you this is what it is to be a woman, you've got to put up with it, then you're going to spend your adolescence at least suffering with period pain without realising it might represent an underlying symptom. Um, so it's about knowing that the symptoms are important, going to your GP, explaining your symptoms and asking for onward management. But for some people, management by their GP may be completely sufficient. Many people are put on hormone therapies, their pain ceases, and actually that's fine. They don't need any further investigation. And I don't think that should be considered as a diagnostic delay. That's someone who's been adequately treated. But they do need to be aware that endometriosis might be an underlying condition so that in the future, when their pain returns, when they get a new pain, when they're struggling to get pregnant, it's already there in the front of their mind. Um, for others, um, they either won't want to start on um, medical therapies or um, they'll start on them and they won't help, in which case the next step is usually an ultrasound scan. Ultrasound scans aren't fantastic for picking up endometriosis, but they will pick up things like um, a large endometrioma assist on the ovary, for example. Um, but usually at that point, you would then be referred into secondary care for discussions about um, sort of more um, detailed diagnostic pathways, um, which can involve an MRI scan. Those are, are more expensive than ultrasound scans, so are reserved, obviously, for um, those in whom we're still not sure what the answers are, um, but they are able to pick up deep disease, signs of adenomyosis, which is commonly comorbid with endometriosis, um, and also again the endometriomas. Um, but the only way of definitively diagnosing at least the superficial peritoneal disease is to do a diagnostic laparoscopy, so keyhole surgery. Um, there are some um, recent papers out suggesting that combinations of microRNAs and things like that may be uh, a promising non-invasive diagnostic test. I'm not sure that um, we've seen enough convincing data to suggest that those are going to come into standard practice in the near future. Uh, they would certainly need a lot more validation. Anyone has something to add? Otherwise, I'll move on to one final question. So um, you uh, you said something, Katie, about if someone is just uh, thinking about period pain is just part of my life because everyone's had it. And there's an interesting question here about whether endometriosis patients should be treated for PTSD. Can you argue that there's years of gaslighting, multiple ineffective surgeries, inappropriate hormonal treatments? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Maybe I can take a little bit on this one. Um, um, so. Can you can you repeat the question the way it was formulated just for me to answer? Yes, the question was, should endometriosis patients be treated for PTSD? There's years of gaslighting, multiple ineffective surgeries, inappropriate hormonal treatments as examples for that. I mean, this is very common in terms of um, the difficulties in accessing care. Um, so obviously there is a, I guess the social factors here are very key uh, in health accessibility. PTSD if there is PTSD involved, of course, um, if, if it's something that the person who lives with it wants, wants to be addressed, yes, but not everyone has PTSD, even if they do, they do have a difficult experience in accessing care. And obviously endometriosis is a spectrum. So it largely depends on symptomatology, social support we have around us, um, there are people who may be, for example, in the lucky position or in the more fortunate position to not have a lot of pain and have, be able to have a, an easy diagnosis or a fast diagnosis. And as Katie said, they might be managing just fine with a GP. So I think it really depends on what the circumstances are. Of course, PTSD might be present for more complex cases or when there is difficulties in care and aggressive I guess, aggressive medical um, procedures that may be required or may not be required. And I think in that case, absolutely, um, that's something that uh, psychological therapies can really help with. And I guess I'd just add to that that um, for some people, obviously, their healthcare journey will have been traumatic. And for some, that will just lead to psychological distress. For some, that will lead to diagnosed PTSD. 
but there's also a, a subgroup who will have had other traumatic experiences that have led to PTSD as well. And I, I in no way want to say that I think that um, the only reason that women have pelvic pain is traumatic experiences, because I think that's really outdated view. Um, and thankfully, there's some really good quality work being done at the moment exploring those relationships. But I think it's often very difficult for people who have had traumatic experiences to engage with some of the pain psychology or the pelvic pain physiotherapy without addressing some of those traumatic experiences. And we know that alterations in your HPA axis, your cortisol response and all those sort of things will influence your pain. So um, to just whilst we shouldn't focus on it alone, I think to ignore past traumatic experiences will do a disservice to women. But it can be very hard to mention those appropriately. And they're not always it's not always right to do it at your first appointment. So, yeah, it, it's got to be personalized, I guess. But I think it would be a shame to ignore it completely. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for contributing to this webinar. It was a great session. Uh, we will. This is recorded, so um, anyone who uh, hasn't been able to see all of it, it'll be added to our website. Um, and I've also posted the links to the two papers that were uh, mentioned in the chat. Thank you all for your work and your continued research. We definitely need it. Um, I wish you all a wonderful rest of the day and a great start to the week. Thanks. Thank you, Melinda. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.